good morning and welcome to another edition of Better Business, Better Life. Today, I'm super excited to be joined by Sarah Stern, who is a certified EOS implement, implementer from Minnesota over in the US. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you for having me. Uh, absolute pleasure. So, Sarah, I'm, I just explained before we got onto the, the podcast, I'm like a little mini New Zealand groupie of Sarah because Sarah is a specialist in family businesses. She's been doing this for quite some time and I follow her intently on online and I love the stuff that she shares. So um, that's why I wanted to invite her onto the podcast to share some of that stuff with us. So looking forward to having a chat about family business. Well, I'm one of your groupies too. So this is a really fun day for me. <laughs> Mutual respect. That's awesome. So, Sarah, you were saying um, before, so you've been a, a certain US implementer or US implementer since 2015. And before that, you were involved in a family business um, part of the university. Is that right? Yes, I was the director of a family business center that was part of a university locally here. Uh, there's about 50 uh, centers like that in the U.S. and there's others uh, around the world. Yeah. Many of them are connected with universities, um, but they're there for family run businesses in their communities to serve mm-hmm. them. And I was lucky enough to run one that was uh, nationally recognized here in the United States. And it was great fun. Oh, that's fantastic. I'm not sure we have that over here in New Zealand, but it certainly sounds like something that's quite needed. We do have a family business organization, but it's an independent run thing. Mm. So um, why family businesses? Why did you choose to get involved with family businesses? I uh, Well, there's a couple things. Uh, one is, uh, if you look at research, family businesses around the world um, give more generously to their communities than any other business. They employ more people than any other types of businesses. Um, and they tend to have a longer horizon when they're making decisions. Uh, that really just appealed to me and my own kind of personal values. And then about 10 years ago, I went through a program and realized my own personal why. They asked this really morbid question, you know, what would you want written on your um, gravestone? And I said, I realized uh, going through that, that I want to make the biggest positive impact I can now and for generations and helping family businesses be really healthy and run incredible businesses is obviously the way to do that. Fantastic. Oh, cool. Hey, so before we get started and delve really deep into some of those things, um, can you just share with us a professional and a personal best so that our listeners can get to know you a bit better? Oh, sure. I'd love to. That's so EOS and so perfect. Uh, so personally, uh, last month I had minor surgery and already last week, uh, I'm just feeling back to myself. So I'm really grateful for incredible health care and good support and my body healing up. So it feels great. Excellent. Thank you for it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and um, I, I think I just accidentally said that was professional, but it kind of was professional that I was able to do that and be back. But that was my personal. Professional is um, I'm finishing up my best quarter ever in my business. And that feels incredible. Oh, wow. Well, congratulations. That's fantastic. Thanks. Thank you. I think when we were talking before, you know, you said you've worked with, you know, 40 or 50 odd family businesses over that time. And obviously family businesses are a little bit unique, aren't they? And they have a, um, they have different reputations. You know, as you said, they're definitely all about the greater community and giving back and making a huge difference, but they can also be seen as being a difficult place to work as well. So I wonder if you could share with me why they get that bad rap, because they have lots of positives, but they still have that bad rap. Yeah. Boy, do they ever, uh, you know, if you look at um, reality TV, it's family businesses everywhere you look, right? So um, one, they make good television because they're willing to yell at each other and scream. And then unfortunately, they do dysfunctional things. So um, unfortunately, though, that's the dysfunction is what gets the attention. But I would say the biggest thing people do in family businesses is they hire people who aren't the right people and they're not in the right seat. They hire people because someone lost a job. They hire someone because... Um, They need someone that minute. Um, And unfortunately, they make the mistake of hiring, you know, family members or close friends. And then they have a terribly hard time uh, getting them either improving their performance or or asking them to leave or even firing them if they need to. That's probably the number one issue. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. And so you would have seen this on a number of occasions, no doubt, in the businesses you work with. And I know that you talk a lot about it online. What is the biggest um, what's the biggest challenge you've kind of seen and how have you helped a family business overcome it? You know, I, the, the most common one I see is this, people will come to me, they're curious, they have a next generation who either the owning generation really wants them to be a part of it, or they never even intended to be a family business. And that next generation is showing interest in it. And they're trying to figure out where everybody should sit. Uh, I got to work with a family business where they had 
five people in the next generation, um, three of whom were already working in the business. Um, two were absolutely the right people. One was not. Um, and two of them had had careers elsewhere and then showed interests. And one of them was the right person and one was not. But the, the thing this family business owner did was bring all five of them in. Yeah. And it was hard. There were tears. There was discomfort. Uh, but we finally were able to figure out really what are the seats needed in the business. And now, um, actually, it's just two of them work in the business um, anymore. Um, three of them, let me do the numbers right. Four of them are actually still owners and one of them was bought out. So we did a whole bunch of work around the seats in the business. And then also that ended up having this nice side effect about who, who still wants to own this business, who still wants to be a part of it. Perfect. Great, great outcome. Yeah. So for people who aren't familiar with EOS, I should imagine, you know, talking about telling people they're not in the right seat or not the right person yeah. sounds horribly yeah. scary. Do you want yeah. to just take us through the process of how you actually work through that in EOS so they can understand? Because it's, it's usually, it's a challenging conversation, but it usually ends up having quite a great result, right? Oh, it has a huge result. And part of it is um, I've started to use the, um, the example of the emperor has no clothes that, um, you know, children's story or whatever, which I have to assume, I assume that's an international story. It is an international story, okay. don't worry. Yeah, yeah. I was about to realize I was a real dingling. Okay, I am a dingling, but I guess not about that one. So yeah. I've started using that as an example lately because in my experience, in most family businesses, everybody, including the person who's in the wrong seat, knows it. Yeah. And, and they're just walking around feeling uncomfortable and everybody else is too. So the thing I do with family businesses is I create what we call the accountability chart, what you and I get to call that. Yeah. And I ask teams to think about if we're looking out six to 12 months, what does this business need? Not what does the family need? Not mm -hmm. what do you need, right? But what does this business need? And that's such an exciting shift for family business owners because usually they're thinking, what does grandma want? What does grandma want? My wife will kill me. My sister will be mad at me. My uncle's going to, you know burn down my house or whatever ter terrifying things they're thinking. Instead, I just say, what is this business that people are relying on? What is the business need? Um, and then take them through the, proce the process to figure out who are the right people. The beautiful thing is, instead of thinking about their uncle, their aunt, their brother, their sister, they just start fighting for the good of the business, which is essentially fighting for the family. Fantastic, yeah. And I think, I don't know about you, but I know I've done this process a couple of times with family businesses now. You've probably done it a lot more times than I have, but it's often a, a bit of a relief for people as well. Like once they realize that they don't actually have to either be in the leadership team or part of the business, sometimes they go, thank goodness, I can yes. go away and do what I want to do, you know? <laughs> but also there is that sort of, um, as you said, it's like if you start to plan out what the business actually needs, I've actually seen people shift completely in terms of what they were doing in the business and going, actually, I really want to do that there that is what my god-given talent is that's what i want to be doing and so i've seen complete shifts with people in terms of what they were doing versus where they they end up oh, i have goosebumps hearing you say that i get to see that all the time too i think people think oh my name is above the front door if i don't do this if i don't do that it's bad or um this is how my mom did it, or this is how my dad did it. I have to do it exactly the same way. And they get stuck under that. And then when they start to focus on, you know, a 10 year target vision yeah. for the business, it's like, oh, there's a need for this. And that's what I've been wanting to do all this time anyway. <laughs> oh my gosh. I had this incredible family business owner um, who just felt that Servant leadership was really an important part. Um, actually, uh, sh she's a fourth generation owner. Um, I think it's her great grandpa used to give haircuts to the oh. employees. You know, he yep. was a true servant leader. And she just had all these things on her list of things she thought she had to do because of this legacy that she's taking part in. And when we started to get more focused on the legacy of the business, she realized there's a lot of ways she could be a servant leader without doing some things like ordering t-shirts, hats, sweatshirts, you know, that had the company logo. And we've gotten her much more, you know, focused on things. You know, her, her grandpa loved, her great grandpa loved giving haircuts. She doesn't love doing that. And she doesn't love ordering sweatshirts. Now she does the things she loves. And that really is more aligned with her legacy anyway. Nobody, even her great grandfather in his time would have said, you should be giving your employees haircuts. But that's what he wanted to do. And that's yeah, what he did. So yeah, now right. she does what she wants to do. And it's, and it's a better fit. 
Yeah, and it gives them such freedom, isn't it, to, to be really authentic and to be who they, yes. they want to be as opposed to what the family, they well, yeah. often it's not what the family expected, it's what they thought the family expected of them. Oh, that is so well said. I think that's what people, it's so easy to think, you know, mom thinks I have to do this, dad thinks I have to do this. And yeah. when you get down to it, mom or dad really thinks, you know, typically, I want you to have a successful business and I want you to be happy. Yeah, we That's do. what they want. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So the accountability trials is a huge tool in terms of family business. What else would you say that has been a, a common challenge and a common way that you've helped to overcome it? There's a, there's a really valuable and really simple tool that Harvard created I think about 45 years ago, and I'm on a personal mission to make it a household word or a household tool because it's not. It's called the three circle model of family business. And I actually printed this out hoping I'd get to talk about it. Oh, cool. I don't know if you can see this. It's just yes. a simple Venn diagram. Yep. Um, and it, it shows you a picture of family business. So there's obviously family. Um, then there's the business and then there's ownership. And in most family businesses, they're only thinking about the family or business circles. Yep. They're not thinking about ownership. And I have to say, I'm assuming a lot of your listeners are driving in a car. So it's a three circle Venn diagram with family, business and ownership in each of the circles. They, of course, all um, overlap right in the center. And this tool is so powerful. If you think, you know, if you're driving your car right now and you think about who am I, right? Am I a family member who's also working in the business? Am I a family member who's also an owner? Uh, there are actually different expectations. There are different um, accountability charts, if you will, for each of those circles. Yeah. And that's incredibly powerful, um, partially to what you just said, just because you're a member of the family or just because you're an owner or even just because you're working in the business does not mean you have to be anybody's boss. Mm -hmm. You have to do the work that you're the right person to do. A lot of people get hung up, especially, right? I'm the oldest kid. I have to run the place. No, <laughs> um, you don't. Um, you have to do the thing you're uniquely skilled to do. That really is what's best for the business and best for the family. And ultimately, of course, what's best for you. So that tool is incredibly valuable just to help people realize you don't have to be the boss of anything yep. uh, just because you happen to be in more than one circle. Fair enough. And I suppose there's also, I mean, a lot of people don't realize, but you don't actually have to be involved in the business at all. You can actually just have an ownership part of the business and not necessarily work in the business too, right? Yes. And that, what you just said right there is, is breaking news for a lot of people when I will say that to them, you know, just because you're an owner. Well, for one, just because you're an owner doesn't mean you're guaranteed a job, yep. right? That's <laughs> yeah, one thing sure. that can be breaking news. <laughs> yes. um, and then the other is, you know, sure. You know, um, I work with a family business. They have four kids. Um, one of them is so good. Um, she's always been interested in the business. When she was a little kid, she came to work with dad, right? On Saturdays. And she was really interested. Um, and one of their other kids is somewhat interested. One of their kids hates the business. Um, she doesn't even want to be an owner. Um, um, and they're looking at, you know, saying, OK, well, what's your part? And you can not even be an owner. Um, but the two of the other kids will maintain ownership. One's a teacher, um, one and works at the business part time in the summer. Right. You know, when he's not teaching um, it, you, you don't have to work there at all. Um, and you can be a great owner. Well, I'm just interested, just prompted something in my brain. It's like actually yeah. for some people, there may be nobody who wants to work in the business going forward. So it might have been a great grandfather who's at the business and he might have been truly passionate about building trailers, but in reality, the rest of the business has zero interest whatsoever. Um, is there a, a pathway to, you know, creating a family business that can be unsold or is there also an option to stay in it? I'm just wondering if you've come across that with a family business before and how you dealt with it. I have. Yes, I yep. am. I just finished my third um, session with a family business. I think they have 28 owners um, who are cousins. Um, two of them happen to work in the business. They're young and they're working their way up. None of them, not one family members on the leadership team. Yeah. Um, that group of 28 owners is doing a lot of work around making sure they have a shared vision. Uh, they have a concept of what it means to own the business. Um, lucky for them, they have a board 
um, that you know has fiduciary responsibilities, and then they work with the board to make sure the businesses run well. I've seen that model happen a lot of times. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of work, and being owners, I mean, my goodness, this circle of being owners gets not enough attention ever, <laughs> uh, and they are learning to be this owning group of 28 people to work together and have this vision and own and run a business. Yeah. I've actually worked with a family business over here in New Zealand who's similar, quite a, a well, high profile kind of family business. And yes, all of the family are owners of this really quite massive business. But I don't think any of them actually work in it anymore. Uh, they just see it as a, a, a family owned business, not a family run business. Yes, <laughs> yes. There's this great term um, that this wonderful family business owner um, that I know, Harry McNeely, talks about having a business family versus a family business, right? You can have a family business, you can have a business family. Um, and uh, uh, say that again? It's like the mob. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's that too. <laughs> I wasn't thinking of that. But right, yeah. a business family, right? Yeah. They they are, a, I'm, I'm just going to make a guess with that yeah. family. There may be business owners among those owners who just don't have, I mean, they own this business, but maybe they're running other businesses, right? So being a family that runs and owns a business mm. uh, is its own own personality of a family its own type of family yeah. somebody needs to do research on that but okay so, so that, that's one option is yes to be remain an owner not be involved in the business and what happens if they realize that actually you just want to get out all together have you worked with the business that's gone you know what we just need to we need to move on it's time for us um, and what have you done to help them with that yeah i um i have a family right now and we're probably I don't know if you can say you're halfway through that process, but they've realized they want to sell the business. It's a fourth generation. The next generation isn't showing interest um, in the business. They just think it's time to do it. And I, I don't, this feels a little like I'm, um, doing an advertisement, but I, um, I saw this big gap um, as far as helping ownership groups understand, wanting to understand their vision. And so I wrote a workbook called Start Here, um, and I've helped that group. Um, I, the, the idea is literally where to start when you're thinking about either succession or a change in your business. Yeah. And um, I've helped them think through as a group of owners, uh, what's important to them. And they're realizing that what they want to do is sell this business. They think they'll probably sell it for quite a bit of money. And then they want to take that money to use to support the family over the next several generations. They just don't want to run the business anymore. Um, that is not what they expected going in, um, but that is the conclusion they've come to after working and talking about this for about a year and a half. Yeah, no, I, mean, I think, and I think this is the thing we, 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 well, not just people who own businesses, but a lot of people in life in general feel like they are stuck in what they're doing and therefore they just have to do it. And, uh, you know, yes. I, you know, it's why I, that's why I think I fell in love with, a little bit in love with Gino with the whole EOS life thing. When he talks about doing what you love with people you love, I think I'm very fortunate. I've been in that for a long time, but now a lot of people aren't doing that. And you kind of yes. go, well, life is too short, you know, you, you don't have to do anything. In fact, there are ways and means to get back to doing what you love with people you love, you know, making a significant difference. The yes. whole US life thing, yeah. And that's what makes my heart sing is actually helping people to realize you can do whatever you want to. Um, you just need yeah. to hear about it. Yeah, it's mind boggling for so yeah. many people. And I think especially these family business owners, because they yeah. think I must serve this legacy. I, you know, don't let grandpa's baby die on my watch. I must yeah. do this. I must do this. I must, 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 must do this. And it's so great when people can get connected to what is the real legacy here, mm. right? There is yeah. usually freedom that an entrepreneur wanted in the first place, usually, right? And then they yeah. get all caught up the in business the takes over their place. life. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. So I love that EOS life um, and what running on EOS brings to family businesses because it, mm -hmm. it just nudges them 90 days at a time closer and closer to continuing an amazing business that's built on a legacy, but also them getting to have this wonderful life that, you know, the founder was imagining. Yes. Well, obviously I was talking to one of your clients the other day and we were talking about his book that he had written. So Danny, yes. um, and that was just so fantastic because he's got quite a large kind of manufacturing um, business, family business, right? And yet yes. while going through the EOS process, he was able to uh, elevate himself out of that day-to-day -day stuff and suddenly have time to do one of his passions, which ended yeah, up- Yeah, so really incredible. Cool. I've got his book right here, this Christmas tree story. I He has, he identified that he really is the visionary in his second 
second generation um, family business, which there isn't always a visionary in the second generation mm-hmm. um, right. or the third or the fourth, right? So he truly is a visionary and he really got in touch with his EOS life, which has meant his business had an incredible year because he's focused more externally. He's having, oh my gosh, I think he actually told you, he's told me too, he's having better conversations with partners, yeah. you know, business partners, better conversations with um, prospective um, partners and customers. It's incredible. Um, and then he also uh, wrote this amazing children's book that is just so much fun. Yeah, and I'm looking forward. My, my copy's in the mail, apparently, so I'm looking forward to receiving that for Christmas. And I don't care that it's a children's book. I think it sounds fantastic. I can't wait to read it. <laughs> yeah. So it's I, great. I don't, know, I don't know about you, but I think that also part of the EOS process, it enables these families to actually have conversations um, in a structured environment, in a structured way, which takes it away from the, the talk around the family table and starts to delineate between this is my family life and I want to make sure yes. I still love all my family and then I've got my business And that's what I found quite powerful is that sort of having that structured meeting where they can actually discuss the business, make sure they're on the same page, do the planning without it impacting or impinging on their, 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 their family life. Yeah. (laughs) It's, it's so true. Instead of things being personal, it's all about, let's face the same direction, Mm -hmm. right. And go, let's, let's stop facing each other and taking things personal and start facing our vision and go there. I mean, just thinking about Danny and his company, Vista tech and self eco, um, you know, they're doing innovative stuff, um, with their business around compostable, um, oh my gosh, planters and dishes and right. And it's like, let's stop focusing on, each other and if this might feel good or bad and what is this incredible offering we can bring that will actually help the planet for generations and that's where Danny and his team are able to focus uh, because they run on EOS and it's it's not a personal thing about oh no, mom I'm, you were I'm, always I'm, mom's favorite yeah. <laughs> It's, I tell you what, I wish I had this tool um, close to 10 years ago. I worked with a family business for the Ice House, which is like an, a business incubator over here in New Zealand. And, you know, I, the, the, they came in because they wanted a vision. They wanted a plan. They wanted to, to plan for the future. And I think the first four two-hour sessions that I spent with them was literally just getting out all of this family angst, all of the, the vendettas, all of the issues around, yes, your mum's favourite. Mum gave you more than, than, than me. Um, she spent more time with you. She loaned you this money and I didn't get that. And so for for eight eight hours, but a total of four sessions, we just had to get all of this stuff out. Um, And just before we could even start talking about the future and the vision. And I think EOS gives you the tools to get more quickly to that and get them very focused on, hey, we are here for the business, for the greater good of the business. We can all benefit from it as long as we're really clear about what we're doing, why we're doing it, who's doing what, um, and do we have the right people around us? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's so, um, it's so true. And if you, um, if you ever hang out with family, well, maybe I'm telling you a big secret of the industry, but if you hang out with family business consultants, they will talk about how the first several hours are these, I'm mad at you. You ruined my bike when we were 10. You stretched out my sweater when you were, ju- right? That's yeah. so common. And I love that EOS takes a lot of that away. Yeah, I, I just love that. It just gets right to the point. And I have to say, by the way, I use Danny as an example here. They weren't doing any of that stuff. They're a very healthy family, but um, <laughs> at least they weren't doing it with me. And actually, I think they just were, they're incredible. Well, you got to talk with Danny. They're just yeah. incredibly good at saying what they think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in a kind and direct way, which is right. um, hard to do, yeah. I think, for most people. And in particular, um, the Midwest of the United States has a uh, reputation for being terrible at that. So. Oh, really? Why, why oh, that? yes. Tell me a bit more about that. <laughs> you know, oh, oh, my gosh, there's so many theories. Um, yeah. Lots of people in the Midwest came from Scandinavian countries. Some people say it's because of the kind of, you know, stiff, stiff upper lip of yes. the Scandinavian companies or c- countries. I don't know. I don't know exactly why, but... We're not, we don't tend to be very good at it. I think it's, uh, I'm going to say probably a little bit similar in New Zealand as well. So I think we come from a very British background and Mm. being British myself, you know, we were always, um, always very, very polite and not wanting to upset anybody. And so it was always about keeping everybody happy. And so the, the tough conversations often weren't, weren't had. And uh, yeah, Ellie, my elephant, is sitting next to me here now. She, she she comes out a lot in the sessions with family businesses because the, the, you know, the, the, the elephant in the room or the sacred cow, the things that have never been talked about, actually when you start the conversation, yes, it's a little bit uncomfortable, but the results that you get from having those conversations is phenomenal. And you know, yes. the way that it focuses the businesses on, on 
on moving and, and to the greater good rather than just for the individuals. Uh, it's, yeah, I just love it. It's 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 not it's, oft, uh, not often had, but when they're had, it can just make such a huge difference. Yeah, it's so huge. I mean, going back to the. Uh, um, the fable around the emperor has no clothes, yeah. right? Yeah. So much better to talk about that than walk around pretending we don't all see it. I mean, yeah. that, it might feel happy, but it's uncomfortable. Nobody wants to see that emperor going through there. So yeah. um, let's just talk about it. Let's get clothes on that person and let's, uh, you know, move forward with things that are more productive. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Oh gosh, we could talk for hours. I mean, like, you know, you and I share lots so of similar passions yeah. and we just love having this fun business. But I, it, it is almost time for us to call it uh, quits. So I'd love to get a couple of tips from you so the readers can take away and actually put some of the thoughts into action so that they, you know, because we want to help them in terms of their journey. Yeah. So what would be your sort of three top tips, tools, whatever you might have? Well, my, um, my biggest favorite tool, I already brought my little picture, um, pull out that, that fam, that three circle model of family business. And I would encourage you to do three things around that. I hope this counts as the three tips. So um, the first thing is, um, think about uh, your vision. Each of those circles should have their own vision. EOS is the perfect tool to help you have a vision in the business circle. Um, again, I, I'm sorry to be doing this, like, advertising for my book, but it's the only book like it that I know of. So um, find a way to have a vision in the ownership circle. And my start here workbook is meant to do that. Um, Will you give us a link to that so we can put that into the podcast? Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Um, So find a way, whatever method you want to have a vision as owners. And I don't care if there's one owner, you still need to have that owner, right? You still need to have a vision. And then find a vision for your family as well. And um, I don't know if you've ever done a session on the personal VT but that's my favorite tool there. It's essentially, you know, your business VTO for your personal life. You can use it for a family. I love that tool. Mm -hmm. Um, Patrick Lencioni also has a book called um, The Three Questions for a Frantic Family or something like that. If you look it up, um, that's also can be another great tool to figure out what your vision is on the family side of things. And then, of course, thinking about the middle of that three circle model is if you're um, you know, an owner and a member of the family and you work in the business is that EOS life. You got to get clear on that and figure out what your vision is. So, I mean, I guess that's three tools in one, but get clear on your vision in all three of those circles and it will help so much. Perfect. Love it. Okay, great. And that's really, really cool. And um, just um, out of personal interest, what is your favorite EOS tool or model that you use? <laughs> Um, my very, very favorite one, I wish it was in the toolbox, but it's not, yeah. is the um, personal issue solving session. Ah, it is okay. only mentioned in the annual on the trust building page. Yes. And it's used, um, I'm assuming you know what it is. Are we yeah. recording still? Yes, we are. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, it's, uh, it's used when trust is broken between two people, which of course can happen in any business, yeah. but certainly, um, can happen in a family business as well. And it's a method to solve an issue between two people where, you know, just get being open and honest in a level 10 or in a session isn't working anymore. It's so powerful. It's my absolute favorite. And I used to know, I think it's on page 144 of the book traction too. Okay, it's a, okay, <laughs> I'm 90% sure that's where it is. <laughs> oh, that's, that's really good. Hey, look, thank you so much for your time this morning. I've really enjoyed finally getting to kind of e-meet oh, you and so hearing fun. about some of the businesses you've worked with. As I say, family businesses is certainly unique, but like you said, it is such a joy to be able to work and to help these families to create a better life. And it's part of the reason I exist. So thank you very much. Hey, if people Thanks want to get in me. contact with you, Sarah, how would they get in contact with you? Well, um, what's what I love about my name is it's a sentence. Sarah B. Stern is my name. Uh, so you uh, it's probably easiest to find me on LinkedIn. Sarah B. Stern. I think I'm the only one who pops up uh, when you type that in. And just for the record, because I'm British. So Sarah is actually spent how we would say Sarah in the UK. So it's without an H, it's S-A-R-A, B. Stern. That's how you'll find her on LinkedIn. I and love it so much. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon and I'll look forward to talking again soon. Oh, thank you. I hope this is really helpful for your listeners. Thank you very much.